you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Well, hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, welcome to the big show, folks. We certainly appreciate it. And now, a man who is emerging in 2023 on January 3rd, the recording date of this, to become a beautiful butterfly for 2023. <laughs> I'm going to fly away right now. That's the video you're seeing on YouTube. Uh, welcome to the big show, Foss, thechrisvossshow.com. There you go. Hey, guys, uh, be sure to check us out. We're going to CES in two days. It's the big CES. 2023 show uh and uh we've got about 30 appointments 30 or 40 appointments of brilliant ceos of people we're going to be interviewing it's going to be a massive show we're going to be doing updates on live you'll see it on linkedin uh youtube twitter all those crazy places so be sure to follow us on those channels as well refer the show to your family friends and relatives we're going to be uh interviewing and reviewing like all this cool technology technology like ai vr uh, dial up phones, uh, hand dial phones, uh, you know, all the latest gadgets, kids, and probably retro gadgets too. I don't know. That seems to always be a thing, but we're going to be at CES doing that for three or four days. Uh, you probably saw our interview with the uh, CEO of CES, the CTA, Gary Shapiro, my good friend who appears every year on the show. And, uh, it's going to be crazy. We're gonna be announcing a lot of stuff. So be sure to watch for that as well. Uh, today we have an amazing author on the, uh, show and we only have amazing authors on the show. Anytime we, Someone says, hey, can I come on the show? And we're like, you're an author who sucks. No, no, we're not mean like that. That's not what we do. It's not a real way to behave, people. We only have amazing authors. That's basically what I'm trying to say on the show. He's the author of the latest book that comes out today, January 3rd, 2023, The Fun Habit, How the Pursuit of Joy and Wonder Can Change Your Life, which is a great way to lead off January 3rd, the beginning of the year, uh, making a fun habit and pursue better parts of your life. Mike Rucker, PhD, is on the show with us today. He's going to be talking to us about his amazing new book and how to have a better year and a better life. If you're listening to this 10 years from now, like some people do on our channels, uh, this uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to look back and go, wow, it's a good thing I listened to that show. And if not, you know, you can always catch up uh, 10 years from now or five years from now. <laughs> Mike, uh, Dr. Mike Rucker is a organizational psychologist. His ideas about fun and health have been featured in Psychology Today, Forbes, Vox, Thrive Global, Global and more. Uh, named one of the 10 Digital Changemakers by the Healthcare Information and Management System Society. He currently serves as a senior leader at Active Wellness, and you can learn more from him at his website. We'll get into that in a second. Welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Rucker. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. This is my uh, coming out podcast, as it were. <laughs> there you go. You're a beautiful new butterfly launching your new book. That's the yeah. do at the beginning or one of them. Uh, anyway, uh, give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, michaelrucker.com. Pretty easy to remember. There you go. And uh, so what motivated you want to write this book? Yeah. So I've been studying positive psychology for some time and the tools of that trade had served me for quite a while. I really got into it about 2005, 2006, became a charter member of the International Positive Psychology Association. And mm. for folks that don't know what that is, it's essentially a movement of psychology that um, wanted to use the tools of psychology, not just to fix mental deficits or treat mental health problems, but um, give them to lay people that, you know, uh, want to better themselves in some way. So don't necessarily, you know, have something they're trying to fix, but can use them to help themselves flourish. And so I had, you know, been a purveyor of that space and used these tools fairly successfully. But I really, over time, had started to chase happiness and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of was trying to over optimize my life for happiness. And unfortunately, in 2016, I kind of got knocked on my butt for a couple mm -hmm. of reasons. Um, one was my younger brother passed away quite suddenly um, for an unexpected reason. He died of a pulmonary embolism. Oh, wow. And I had been an avid athlete up until that point. And so these two things 
don't have a relation to each other, but a couple of months later found out that I had advanced osteoarthritis. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'd used running as a way to mitigate stress and anxiety up until that point and was told by doctors because I had, um, you know, had this ailment at such a young age that I essentially couldn't run anymore. And so, oh. you know, I had been, you know, Mr. Positivity, Mr. Optimism up until that point and, um, was really trying to like will myself out of this malaise, out of this despair that, you know, really was an appropriate response for what was happening to me. But for, you know, I was just trying to not accept that. And paradoxically, as I was trying to chase happiness, I ended up being less happy. And, um, you know, to the point I was kind of, you know, grinding myself into the ground. And I've I found that quite interesting. And I guess, you know, using this word serendipity is kind of weird in this context, but around that same time, there was all of this emerging research to suggest that, especially here in the US, this, you know, what we're what's now commonly referred to as toxic positivity, mm. really causing a lot of, you know, low level mental illness, actually, you know, the more that you, the motivation doesn't really match, you know, your level um, at that time can lead to, some really interesting and um, you know unfortunate sort of outcomes, and so I wanted you know it, it, if all of these tools that had been helpful up until that point were working anymore, I needed to figure out how to fix myself, right? And so that was sort of uh, you know the beginning of this journey of of trying to figure out what well you know if, if you can't have this over concern and will yourself out of unhappy, what can you do? And what I discovered is that a lot of us aren't actively reclaiming our agency and autonomy. A lot of us have just habituated our lives in ways that, you know, just kind of run into each other. Mm -hmm. And that just being a little bit mindful of how we spend our time and reintegrating play and fun into our daily lives really can be all that's needed to get ourselves out of things that, you know, are unfortunate, you know, whether it's the loss of someone, whether that's someone going through a divorce, you know, whatever it is, when we realize that we have a little bit more control uh, over how we spend our time, even in the context of bad things that might be happening to us, then we're able to pick ourselves up and really start Uh to enjoy life again. Uh So uh, what is the definition of toxic positivity? I haven't heard that term too much. I know, you know, there's the, what's that work thing that they, they like to do is it's kind of comes out of bro code in San Francisco, the hustler sort of attitude and people have been getting hustler burnout where, you know, working 24 seven and kind of the attitude of not taking your time off. What, what's the definition of positive or I'm sorry, toxic positivity. I think it's the old adage, good vibes only, which I certainly conveyed, you know, like um, this idea that bad emotions are somehow problematic, right? That none of us have oh. bad days. And if you have one that somehow, you know, you need to course correct it immediately. And I think, you know, from a deeper level, you know, from, you know, more of the geek side, it's when you're providing motivation to someone that doesn't really hit, right? And so when that happens, when there's this motivational misalignment, like, wow, okay, I guess I really should have good days only, you know, good vibes only or whatever it is. And that's not necessarily where you're at. Then you start to have dissonance about, okay, wow, well, everyone around me, you know, is, is living the good life, which isn't true at all, right? Most of us are living, especially online curated lives, right? And so there, there starts to be this misidentification about who you really are. And that's when it gets really problematic. I unpack this in the book, but once you see happiness as somewhere off in the distance, then you start to really ruminate on that gap between where you want to be and where you are. And over time, what happens is that identity, right, of, okay, well, I'm not happy yet, starts to sort of evolve into, well, I must be an unhappy person. And that can happen Mm -hmm. at the subconscious level. And that's when things really go awry, because then it becomes harder and harder to get back, you know, to, you know, your level of happiness that that you were at, you know, um, pre, you know, episode, whether again, that's, you know, loss, change, divorce, whatever it is. Let me ask you this. You, you know, we live in this Instagram age. I've been a social media dude uh, mm-hmm. coming of age with Twitter in 2008. And I've watched the evolving nature of it. And what was what was originally, you know, this beautiful promise, uh, you know, this this revolution. Uh, and, you know, the world's going to be more kumbaya. We're all going to be like John Lennon, sit around and 
and sing imagine all the people uh, living in peace and uh you know now it's the pandora's box is completely open and and the the beautiful uh thing that we saw coming out of it has turned into kind of a hell spawn uh you know we live in a world where these people in the instagram age i mean i don't know if you study the young people on tiktok but they there's a lot of delusion um where the fomo the fear of missing out you know you you have people that can pay to go sit in a fake plane in a hollywood studio that's a cutout plane and pretend that they're flying on planes you know uh they go on dates and take pictures on the dates like they're living the high life and you know uh it, it's crazy it's um, manufactured for sure it's <laughs> totally it, a lot so much of it's manufactured and like um it, it, but, but the problem is people believe it especially women they really believe it um you know in the dating markets and you know i've, I've seen interviews with people and they're like yeah i want to find a millionaire um, trillionaire freaking dude um and you're like do you really just maybe one percent of the <laughs> of the population does that we live in this really messed up world where th there's so much delusion and you're right i mean i i thought when i got money i'd be happy i grew up poor and so I tried to overcompensate. And when I became rich and was able to buy all the toys I want, turn my house into a giant toy store, arcade, if you will, um, I thought it would make me happy. And I thought the pursuit of, of working so hard and grinding and never taking vacations would make me happy. And I was more miserable when I was uh, when I was had more money than ever. Um, I was more miserable than ever. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the. So I think what happens is we get disconnected to what really lights us up, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, you had mentioned social media, it starts to become manufactured from these external influences, right? So mm -hmm. one, you start to stop thinking for yourself and you're like, okay, what are other people doing? And that might not necessarily be what you want, but you get kind of baited, right? By, yeah. well, they look happy, they have this big smile, like maybe I should be doing this. When that doesn't resonate with you at all, if you spent the time to kind of understand what it is that really makes you happy. So that's one problem. The other is this artificial currency of how you're rewarded, right? So I call it, you know, at the nothing army, right? You have all of these folks that have no interest in your well-being incentivizing you through likes and comments, you know, that are really built by an external algorithm. So they don't mean mm -hmm. anything to you. But slowly over time, you're trained to believe that they do, right? Like, oh my gosh, well, this thing obviously is interesting, so let me do more of it, even though it adds nothing to your own betterment, right? And so mm -hmm. just taking one step back, not necessarily villainizing social media, because I think it's a great way to stay connected with people, mm -hmm. but if it's ultimately what's driving your decisions, then you need to take a hard look at, okay, why has that happened? And then two, spend a little bit of time, you know, reconnecting with what it is that really does make you happy and not necessarily worrying so much about, you know, this, these external outcomes that don't really have any bearing on your life. Yeah. It, it's, you know, and it, I think people think that, well, I should be happy like that person or that person is doing this or they're, they're flying on vacation. And there's so many people that you see that are fake it so hard. And then when they mm -hmm. get called out or they get caught, you're just like, oh, wow. I remember there was a famous married couple running around talking about being married, and they're driving all these nice cars. Turn out they're just running huge scams. They get arrested. They're going to jail for a long time. You're just like, wow, they're just ripping people off. I mean, uh, the fire, what was it, the fire festival years ago? But, yeah, I don't think social media is to blame. But uh, it seems like we've, you know, there's some some people that need to read your book and go, hey, man, um, not all, not all the glitters is gold, and uh, the fence, is, uh, the green grass isn't always better on the other side. So, what is a fun habit? You talk about your book about uh, starting to build fun habits. What is what is that term well, mean? So, essentially, it's just looking at the fact that we aren't spending enough time at all on activities that do bring joy and delight. So, I guess you know, just last week there was a. a a LinkedIn news article about how we're second to last in the world with regards to our um, communal use of PTO in America. It was, you know, there's one other country, I forget which it, it is, but we're second to last. We get 10 days a year and we don't use those, right? Where yeah. other, 
you know, other countries throughout the world really do protect that time outside of work. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, but I believe within this post, they cited um, a recent study that showed 27% 20 of the people out there in, in the workforce are so burnt out, they don't even know how to enjoy themselves anymore, <laughs> right? And so what I you know researched in the book is that this has kind of been systemic for a while, right? You know, whether mm -hmm. you want to call it hustle porn, which we've referred to earlier, yeah. um, whether it's just, you know, the old Puritan work ethic, ultimately, you know, once we switch to knowledge work, um, we don't really know what the goalpost is, right? And mm -hmm. so we think that we value or overvalue for that matter productivity, but we don't realize that even if that is something that we value, if we mm -hmm. burn ourselves out, we're not able to contribute or be the best versions of ourselves. So what does that mean? What it means is that we need to start figuring out how to take a little bit off the table for ourselves again, so that we are enjoying life, so that when we do show up for the things that matter, like our family and our jobs, we're full of vitality and vigor to do those things well. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's sort of this insidious thing that happens, right? Over time, you're like, oh, well, I just can work a little bit harder. And again, it goes to that, you know, the, that mirage out there in the distance, right? Like I'll arrive someday. And then ultimately you wake up and go, holy cow, I've just wasted my life. And yeah. so what, what we find is the folks that are the most successful are the folks that take a little bit off the table for themselves if they're really enjoying their time and that when they show up, you know, for the things that are dutiful, like work and, and family matters, they're really in it. You know, sometimes it's called deliberate practice, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, you're really engaged in that activity, which paradoxically makes even hard things more fun, more enjoyable to be in because you're not so burnt out. You're not looking at it as just like, oh, okay, if I just get this done, then I can move on, you know, actually get some sleep or whatever it is. So I often like to use the fact that if you remember in the 90s, sleep deprivation was worn as a badge of honor, right? Like, yeah. oh man, I was just grunt. Hustle and, porn. Yeah, and that, I mean, we now know how asinine that was. Even the most staunch, you know, folks that, you know, the Gary V's of the world that, and I like Gary V a lot, mm -hmm. you don't hear him saying, you know, just wait, put your the kids to bed and, and work till three in the morning because he knows that sets people up for failure. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a better way. Even if you're a hustler, what that means is that you should have a fun habit in your life so that, when you do show up for work, when you have that transition ritual, okay, this isn't leisure anymore. This is, you know, um, time served for productivity. Then you're really crushing it within those hours too, because you're living a nice, well-rounded, well-lived life. Yeah. The, I mean, that makes all the difference in the world. Totally makes all the difference in the world. Uh, it's uh, being happy is more important than being, um, you know, busyness. What's, what's the axiom I'm trying to reach for? Busyness doesn't equal happiness, I guess. And we, we think that that hustle porn, that, that busyness makes a difference. In your book, you talk about the four quadrants of the play model and how it will help you assess your daily activities. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Tease that out if you would. Yeah. So I have a model in the book called the play model. It essentially stands for pleasing, living, agonizing, and yielding. And those things are just a interesting way to divvy up your time so that you can see in the 168 hours you spend in any given week, how much of that is actually bringing you some sort of pleasure, right? So that you mm -hmm. at least have a balanced approach to living a joyful life. And so what happens is a lot of people that go through that realize like, oh my goodness, everything that I'm doing is for someone else or just something that I don't enjoy. And so even if it's things that you have to do, because some of the resistance, you know, especially for, folks stuck in the sandwich generation, you know, who have, mm -hmm. who are, are taking care of kids, but also have aging parents that they need to take care of, you mm -hmm. know, it might be that they can't find time for fun. And for me to prescribe fun as, you know, something that they need to add to their schedule would essentially be another version of toxic positivity, right? Like, <laughs> hey, let's just, you know, let's add another thing to your already full plate. So, there's a bunch of strategies in the book of, okay, so you have to do this, but how could you potentially do it in a way that's more enjoyable for you, which again is going to allow you to be a better version of yourself and to show up serving those people that you have the sense of duty for in a way that not only lights you up a little bit more, but makes it more pleasant for them. Um, and then, uh, you know, essentially just how can you potentially free up space? So even the most busy folks, when they use this model, often find out like, oh my goodness, 
you know, I thought I had no time, but when I've done, you know, when I've used the play model and, and, and become curious about how I spend this 168 hours, you know, I looked on my phone app and I was, I've actually been on Facebook three hours, you know, during the week. And I could just swap that out for going to do something that I used to really enjoy, you know, whatever that is for you, a hobby, engaging in, you know, something as simple as boil, bowling with friends, like anything that allows you to reconnect with the things that really did bring you joy, you know, before you kind of got over, you know, overburdened with all these things that life, life does to us. Yeah. We need that time out. We need, we need time to recharge and, you know, so many people give, you know, I mean, they're just running a uh, hundred miles an hour. They don't take time to breathe. They don't take time to fun. And I, I, I imagine a lot of people don't ask themselves, am I having fun yeah. in life? Am I doing this? Uh, is this really fun or do I think that it's, you know, like we mentioned before, hustle porn where you're, where you're just like, well, if I grind hard, it'll be fun. Or like you mentioned earlier, you, you alluded to this, uh, the putting it off to, well, I'll be, I'll be happy in the future when I achieve this goal that I'm grinding for. That's right. And that's, you know, where happiness kind of becomes problematic is one, we adapt, right? So to your point, we make more money, but that, you know, if that kind of brings us to a new social status, we adapt to the norms of that social status. And then there are always new things that we need to go and chase, right? Um, and then it, it's an active comparison. If we don't take time out for ourselves to figure out what is it that I really want to enjoy. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that has to be a selfish act, right? It, it mm. could mean, what do I want to enjoy with my family? How do I want to engage in life? A little bit more playfully so that not just me but the people around me are actually experiencing life a little bit more pleasurably you know what are these things that can contribute to my own betterment if we don't stop and do that oftentimes you know especially with social media it becomes an exercise in comparing with others and that doesn't necessarily mean anything to us it just means like you know we're using somebody else's goalpost mm -hmm. and and, and I can tell you the empirical research suggests that 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 is always not going to bring us joy, right? Because we're essentially prescribing to someone's out, you know, someone else's perception uh, of what the good quote unquote good life is. And we're not thinking about what it is that actually, you know, brings us joy. And again, that happens over time. So we even forget, you know, a lot of adults even forget how to have fun or, or how to experience pleasure because they've been working for so long. You know? Yeah, it reminds me of that. Uh, reminds me of that scene from uh, what was it, American Beauty, where the guy starts uh, making out with his wife, and uh, and for the first time they're they're kind of uh, becoming friendly again. Let's put it that way. And then she notices that uh, he's about to spill his beer on the couch and ruins yeah. the moment. And you're like, hey man, and he's like, what happened to the fun person I used to know? <laughs> and I think a lot of times, you know, we don't. We don't ask ourselves that. Am I having fun? Where's my time out? Where's my recharge space? Where's my, you know, we just drive, we just push ourselves to the ends of the earth or push each other to the end of the earth. And we, we don't enjoy that moment. And being in that presence, you know, what you're talking about with the, you know, being fun is also being present because you're asking yourself, am I having fun? Am I enjoying doing this? Um, you know, I used to have people say to me, you know, it's oh, it's great that you become successful and you you've achieved your you know building businesses and all this kind of thing, and now you can finally just kick back and be happy. And you're like, no, I can't. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, we've got good. we've got a multitude of companies, we've got over a hundred employees that are driving me crazy. I got a business partner that's driving me crazy. Um, the all that all that happens when you become more successful and you attain your goals is the the tightrope that you're walking on just goes higher and higher, and you're like looking down, going, "I can't quit my job because no one can afford to pay me," and uh, it's a long ways down from here, you know. And then you realize so many you're you're beholden to so many people, you know, hundreds of employees and stuff like that, and so. It, it becomes harder. And I used to try to explain it to people. And there's somehow this delusion in our society that when you get money or get success or you get a bigger business or whatever your thing is, that it's going to be easier. That like somehow there's this peak that you hit and then it's all just like, oh, yeah, just cruising after that. That's no, right. it's not. Yeah. You know, it's that it's the old. Uh, I remember watching Fight Club and I, I've got three uh, places in three different cities i'm living in with four offices i got a bmw at any given airport at any given time waiting for me 
Um, and I'm sitting there going, I'm miserable. And I've, you know, I've got this house uh, with all the stuff in it and everyone hates me. Everyone doesn't like me because I'm a, I'm a bitter asshole CEO. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't that bad, but you know what I mean? If everyone's like, we need more from you. And you're like, I, how much more do I need to give you? And I, I got to cut my heart out and cut on the string. And I remember watching fight club and the line, the things you own end up owning you. That's right. And people don't realize that when you become successful, you you do all that hustle porn, it just makes more work. Yeah, and you that's just have to work harder. Both a literal and metaphorical statement, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I think, and and another thing you touched on, just to add a scientific component, I mean, social contagion is real. So, again, whether you're a leader or just a you know the head of a household, you know, um, when you get to a point where everything is, you know, through the lens of burnout, where you're just not happy to be present, then that starts to infect everyone around you, right? And mm -hmm. so, and it, it it's a slow process. So you can either live in a sort of downward spiral, or you can live in an upward spiral where, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sidestep your priorities, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. still have things that you should thrive for, that are set up deliberately, but at the end of the day, also figure out how you can enjoy the process. Because to your point, there is no end point. You're not going to arrive somewhere. You yeah. know, I mean, life goes on, right? You're going to hit your goal, and then you're going to need to continue on. And if you are so episodically focused on that goal that you kill everyone to get to that point, I mean, you know, look at what Elon's doing to Twitter right now, right? I mean, that you know, if if you get to that stage where you don't have any good people left because no one around you is enjoying themselves, then you're ultimately killing the thing that you wanted to build in the first place. There you go. There you go. It's it's and there's science, I guess, behind this. You cite some science studies in your book. Yep. A lot of them. <laughs> there you go. And then one thing you talk about that I found was interesting, uh, how fun and productivity are not at odds, but rather amplify each other. Um, and uh, so, how do you have fun and be productive, I guess? Yeah, so there's a, an amazing study out of Harvard, Stanford, and MIT. It's essentially looking at what science calls the hedonic flexibility principle. Mm. And so you don't necessarily need to know what those words mean. But what the study found is that, again, you know, obviously, when we're burnt out, we look for forms of negative escapism, right? So mm. if someone really isn't finding joy in their life, it should be of no surprise that, you know, they go out and do things like drink or, you know, whatever it is. But when you integrate, you know, kind of this mosaic of fun things throughout your daily and weekly activities, that sets you up to have the resilience and the vigor and vitality to do the harder stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what the study found is the folks that are actually enjoying life and taking, you know, some time off the table for themselves, are the ones that are thriving the most because they show up at the beginning of the day, you know, really ready to work and really ready to seize the day. And then when that is over, then they, you know, they go off and have fun and they realize that, you know, life is worth living uh, mm -hmm. juxtaposed to the person that's just grinding it out, waiting for, you know, that next shiny nickel, at, you know, at the next milestone that doesn't really understand, you know, when they look back after 10 years of grinding what they did it for. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, a lot I, I watched when I was growing up, and a lot of people I watched accept social standards, accept, you know, things like, you know, hustle porn or go grind it. And then, you know, I remember, uh, I remember, you know, my, my big thing I was taught with my generation was, hey, you go to work for the man corporation for 40 years and you come out and you get a gold watch, you know, it's still the 70s. So you got like, you know, that was the thing, you know, you, you work for GM for 40 years and, and they took care of you. They didn't lay you off. And, you know, then the 80s kicked in and Ivan Bioski and, and uh, Greed is Good and, and uh, Michael Milliken and Junk Bonds and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And uh, then everything, you know, uh, became transitionary. Uh, employees became something you could easily throw out to raise your stock price. And I remember growing up watching it all. And I, I said to my business partner, when we started our, our first major business. Uh, I said to him, I go, you know, we're both 22. And uh, we can do one of two things. We can go for this and make this business work. Uh, thankfully, it did. 
Uh, or we can go do the corporate thing we're kind of on track to. But I said, you know, I don't know. I, I got to tell you, I don't think at 40 or 50, when I go and parachute out of a company, I'm going to have the energy for this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was right, because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there, I'm at there are multiple headwinds that happened, right? So, we, you know, anyone that reads Daniel Pink, you know, in Drive, he, you know, showed how we'd moved from algorithmic work to heuristic work, which is essentially information work. So nobody knows where the goalposts are anymore. Yeah. And you can essentially fill your whole week with work if you want to now, because, you know, especially with creative endeavors, right? There's always something to do. You can, you know, there's always a new post. There's always a new idea. You know, if you don't have a transition ritual into, okay, this isn't work time anymore, that can become problematic. And then with the advent of smartphones, you know, our parents, the day was over when they got home, right? They mm -hmm. had a transition ritual. They put their briefcase up, they put their coat on, and then they enjoy time with their partner and their kids. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we walk in still on a business meeting on our phone. So, you know, that's a cue to our kids that they're not important yet, right? So they stay on their phones. Um, and then, you know, oftentimes we're answering emails till our head hits the pillow. And mm -hmm. so we don't know when our work day is over. And so even if we're only, you know, we can really kid ourselves that, you know, but I, I am there, you know, I'm at the park with my kids or whatever it is, or, I, you know, I'm at this nice dinner with my friends. But if you peel back, like what's really happening, you're staying on your phone and that's not real engagement, right? That's not real mm -hmm. connection with the folks that you love. And so, you know, another big theme, especially for this decade is how bad, you know, this new level of loneliness is affecting us. And that's even loneliness in the midst of thinking that we are, you know, being with our friends when we're sitting there with our friends, but really on our phones. And yeah. so, you know, we're getting these little hits of dopamine, but we're not getting that, um, uh, um, excuse me, the, uh, you know, that, that feeling of, of social connection that really is important. Yeah, we, I mean, <clears throat> you, you bring up an excellent point. I mean, our parents didn't have you know, emails pinging you when you got home at six o'clock to watch the TV. You know, we didn't have phones that were like, Hey man, uh, boss wants to talk to you real quick about this, uh, extra thing you got to do or coming to work some extra hours. You know, if your boss called, you just let him go to the answer machine and, and then say you weren't home or something. And <laughs> yeah. Leave you, you know, well, not now, only that, but like 24 hour seven news cycle. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, we still had these, you know, what productivity specialists called time blocks. Like my parents would watch the news at 6 p.m. to 6.30 and then the news was over. There was nothing sort of yeah. antagonizing them throughout the day, reminding them that, you know, two major countries are at war and, you know, how terrible, you know, things are everywhere. I mean, there is an abundance of good and an abundance of bad, and that's always been there. But our yeah. access to consuming, you know, what some people call doom scrolling, bad news now is at nauseum, right? If that, if you have a propensity to that type of negativity, it's always there for you now. Where before there were bumper rails because we just didn't have access to information like we used to, right? Yeah. Or and, I and I mean, if you're a CEO or if you're a PR agent for a company or uh, just about any company or, you know, everyone's a brand now. I'm a brand. I'm yeah. a brand. Uh, everyone's a brand now. So you're doing brand management. So you're managing comments, trolls, uh, if you're a CEO of a major company, you know, you can be, everything can be fine and dandy and someone says something bad or someone bad, you know, cites your name, you know, and suddenly your company is, you know, in the PR shit and you're just like, ah, you know, it's, everything was fine. And then, uh, some, you know, something happens and suddenly you're trending on Twitter and you've got to address <laughs> it. And you're like, why are we trending on Twitter? What do we do? What happened? <laughs> And, you know, sometimes it doesn't even have to be you. Like, I think I'm trying to think of some recent examples where someone bad said something bad and they include the name or a picture of a brand like Skittles or something. And and the brand has to respond, even though they didn't they weren't the ones who caused the kerfuffle. They just got caught up in it. And, you know, it's like, oh, what, have you made a statement or do you agree with that evil person? And you're like, what? how do we get like, yeah, I, just be, get the CEO, I just be like, are you? <laughs> serious we were going along fine no one was messing with us we're just doing our thing and everything's good and you know some evils uh, out there in the world and now you know it's the, the it's the paint's been thrown on our uh on our name um so yeah 
it's it's really important to identify having fun. I enjoy my life now more without the big companies and all the things. I have you, you can't put a price on freedom and peace. Absolutely. Um, you can't put a price on not having business partners. <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, so you know I I love it and there's a certain there's a certain amount of sacrifice that you have to give up for that, but the there's also a sense of security and living longer because you know that stress kills you what's kind of funny you know i had some people that have come on the show that were some of the uh gen zers that exited with the great resignation and they cashed out their 401ks and it was funny one gentleman has sat down and done the math on when people die when men die you know because we die earlier than women usually right about three he, years he'd done the math and i think there was some genetics of cancer and stuff in his background with his family and he said you know i figure maybe i have good 10 to 15 years or at least good 10 to 15 years to travel see the world and be in a be in a body that can do that yeah. and um and probably enjoy it too like i you know i, I don't know about you but i could i could travel the world but it wouldn't be that fun <laughs> <laughs> maybe if you wheeled me around everywhere in a wheelchair or something, I'd be happy. But you know, there's a certain amount of walking where I'm like, can I just go home and sleep in my bed? You know, I'm kind of at that age. I, I can see France on, you know, I can do the Google <laughs> thing and see France. Uh, I don't need to be there and smell it. Uh, but no doing the jokes. Uh, but you know, there's a certain point and, and he was like, you know, I want to enjoy the last few years of my life. And I'm, I, yeah, I could hold on to the 401k and the big retirement, but I don't think I think I'm be dead by the time I try and spend it. Yeah, and think, uh, so why not spend it now? So everyone's going to kind of figure what their comfort level is to that, but yeah. I think there is a lot of truth to understanding that you know we've kind of been conditioned because we do live in a meritocracy that you know everything's going to kind of happen down the line. You know, you had mentioned that golden, you know, wristwatch, right? And that's when you know you get to really experience life. But if you think about it, you know. The folks, we know this from Bronnie Ware's work on the five regrets of the dying, like the mm -hmm. folks that have sort of mortgaged life, um, you know, in the hopes that, you know, all of this hard work will pay off, you know, in your 60s or 70s, you've really lost a lot of, you know, this capacity because time is the only finite resource. You know, again, you need to be fiscally responsible, but at the end of the day, anyone can make more money, but you can't make more time. And so mm -hmm. that's, you know, really mm -hmm. important to take to heart, right? Is like, okay, again, be mindful of money. We certainly don't want you to be in the poor house. So figure out, you know, what that means to you. But oftentimes people way overvalue the importance of money and underestimate the fact that they only have a limited amount of time left. So I unpack that in the book, you know, some strategies to sort of understand that time really is the only finite resource we have. Mm -hmm. And once we intimately understand that, then we start to make better choices, you know, Often in the scientific literature, it's called time affluence. And what we know of that people that do kind of worry more about how do I live my best life through time instead of money tend to be a lot happier than the folks that think they need to accumulate wealth to be happy. Yeah. And, and you bring up an important point because we don't know how much time we have. It can end tomorrow. Uh, and um for those you know, who follow football, look what happened yesterday. Yeah, the yeah. one uh, who uh, who uh, he had a heart attack. They had to spend uh, was the Buffalo Bills. They had to spend yeah. or uh, they had to spend uh, fifteen minutes doing CPR on that gentleman. And I've always enjoyed the the game of football, but you know that's the, being at that store over. And he it didn't look like it was that hard of a hit, but you know people have different physical internals that sometimes don't respond well. To stuff or you know it could have been anything but but you, you don't want to see that but yeah we don't we don't know when our time comes you could you could do you could be like i'm going to do hustle porn for 10 years and then and then i'll enjoy my life and five years in you get hit by a bus you know well, when you brought up stress we know people that do grind it out like that tend to you know um not stress kills you yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean you know stress just kills you google a you know type a and um correlate that with you know health outcomes and you know all that research is there too the stress kills you and you know everything you do i mean i said i drank heavy for about 20 years of my life um and drank a lot of caffeine uh drank a lot of mountain dews you know sugar and and uh and the, the caffeine i still drink a lot of caffeine but i drink coffee 
but you know for me uh drinking especially in the I would drink in the evenings. Um, and usually that was to get more work done. And I'm like, Hey, if I drink this, I get a little bit more, you know, cause drinking turns to sugar. And so I'd be like, Hey, I can work a few more hours and relax. I can, I can get a few more things done, you know? Yeah. And, uh, as, you know, as CEO and self-employed, you're, you're like, ah, well, you know, push it, push it, push it. <laughs> and, you know, you've got to take that day. Like you talk about in your book to go, let's be happy today. Let's enjoy yeah. today. Because that may be all you have. Tomorrow you could wake up and the bus runs over you or whatever. Uh, or having fun with uh, the people in your life, too. You never know. They can go at any time as well. And uh, you never know. So be present. I'm sure you've heard the adage, right? Most self-employed entrepreneurs hate their boss. <laughs> so yeah. try, to, try to not hate your boss. <laughs> I, I, see him in, I, see him I like him. He's good. We're going to keep him. <laughs> <laughs> now, because the last time I checked, he's the only ride I got. Uh, <laughs> until I can figure out how to possess another body, we keep holding these <laughs> demonic uh, pagan rituals every <laughs> Halloween at the house here. But I uh, haven't quite got the whole uh, exorcism transfer thing down, <laughs> but uh, we're just going to stick with the demon that's in my body for now, I guess, right now. Right. So uh, the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> anyway, an exorcist joke for those of you who haven't once seen the movie. Um, so it's been wonderful, Mike, to have you on the show. Thank oh, you very much for coming on. Yeah, and, thanks for having uh, me. There you go. Give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Yeah, again, uh, you know, I talk about the science of fun at michaelrucker.com and the book, The Fun Habit, my debut from Simon Schuster is out. This very second, today's mm. the launch day. So nice. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so, congratulations on the new book. These are Thank always you so fun. Much. They're, they're always fun. And I uh, hope it sells a billion. And please come back for the next one. <laughs> All um, right. Thanks so much. There you guys go. Oh, order up the book wherever fine books are sold. The Fun Habit How the Pursuit of Joy and Wonder Can Change Your Life. Use it for the new year. It's a good time to set some new resolutions. Of course, the resolution I'm keeping this year is uh, still at 2K. Maybe we'll move to 4K on the uh, gaming video screens. But, you know, we like 2K. It's, it works well. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go uh, for the show your family, friends, and relatives. Go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, all those crazy places we're on the Internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.